Uh, we are so lucky because, you know, first, I, I'm very blessed. I, I was able to grow my business 3.2 million last year, and I feel like, oh, that's so great, you know. And I happen to know somebody who has a $100 million business. In the personal growth space, and uh, his name is Reed Tracy. He's the CEO of Hay House. He started with them when they were mu super small, and he was really the mastermind and driving force to growing them to uh, the level of success that they're at. Um, lots of well-known authors have their books published with Hay House, and. Um, and he, Reed's going to be talking to you about how to write a great best-selling book, how to get published with a, um, with a publisher, and also, you know, if you want to self-publish your book, the advantages of self-publishing and, and uh, how to transition, if you are a self-published author, how to transition to working with a publisher, and probably tons of other stuff. He's a, uh, an absolute, probably... I don't know that there's anybody that has more expertise about publishing um, personal growth, self-help type books than Reed Tracy. So you guys are in for the greatest treat ever. So please, let's all stand up and give a standing ovation welcome for Reed Tracy. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. So, um, how many of you have heard of Hay House before? <laughs> so that's always a good sign. It makes it easier for me. Um, so, you guys are all coaches, I take it. Or how many of you are coaches already? And how many of you are planning to be coaches? A few of you. So, it's a good blend in there. So, as we go through um, my talk today, I'm going to tell a few stories of um, some of our authors who are kind of were in the same position as you were in and became, well, you know, successful co coaches. Some of them, uh, you, one of the stories I'm going to tell will be about someone who worked at Hay House and transitioned into being a coach and now has a uh, uh, a six-figure coaching business and how she did that and how she used her books as part of that. But to begin with, I'm just going to start off and tell you my story so you can um, see where I come from, see, you know, why you want want to listen to what I have to say and, <laughs> and, um, and my experience so far. So like Christian said, I've been at Hay House since 1988. So I've been at Hay House for 27 years. This is my 27th year. Um, Hay House has been around for 28 years. It started in 1987. Um, at Louise started Hay House when she was 60 years old. So any of you out there that are thinking you're too old to get started in all this, <laughs> she's here to prove you wrong because she started Hay House at 60 and she's now sold, of You Can Heal Your Life alone, over 40 million books around the world. Um, so hey, when I started at Hay House, we had three books and five tapes. <laughs> uh, so it was a whole lot different company than you see today. And our sales were around a million dollars. Um, for the next 20 years, our sales went up every single year for 20 straight years. Um, and, then in the, and then we had three years that the sales went down, and then the sales started going up again in the last three years. Um, part of the reasons the sales went down is there was a company called Borders that you guys probably all know that went out of business, and we were one of the 10 biggest creditors for Borders, so they were one of our biggest accounts. But overall, we've had a lot of success. And before I came to Hay House, um, when I was deciding what I was going to do to go to college, I, how I decided is I looked in the help wanted section of the newspaper. And I looked which had the most help wanted ads. And this was in 1981 is when I started college. 
and the biggest things were engineering and accounting. And so I had had an accounting class when I was in high school, so I said, all, all right, I'm going to do accounting. <laughs> and so <laughs> I went to Long Beach State University, and I majored in accounting and investment finance. And I had never heard of any of this self-help stuff ever before. So <laughs> I, um, so I got my d degree in accounting, and one of the um, classes I had in the university was comparative literature, 20th century literature. And then you had to read like 20 books, and I'm like, what the hell am I doing in this class? <laughs> And when I finally graduated from college, the one thing I said is, thank God I don't have to read any more books. <laughs> 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 but the universe had different ideas for me. <laughs> but at that time, I didn't even know what the universe was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it was a whole different transition. So. I, st I became an accountant, uh, and then I became a CPA. I passed the CPA exam, and I was working in public accounting in Long Beach. And then I moved um, up to Santa Monica, and, we wor and I worked in a CPA firm that was right across the hall from Hay House on Wilshire Boulevard in Santa Monica, California. And all of us in the CPA firm were looking at all those weird people going in and out of that. <laughs> that Hay House place. And um, in March of 1988, Louise um, was on Oprah, Louise Hay was on Oprah and Donahue in the same week. And at that time, Donahue was bigger than Oprah. So it was huge. I mean, it, Louise went from someone that was basically unknown that we sold the books, or they sold, I wasn't even there yet, the books in metaphysical bookstores, the, to give you an idea, nowadays we see Barnes & Noble, those stores with 100,000 books in them. Um, we see the self-help section in those books, huge. Alternative health in those sections, huge. In 1988, there were no big bookstores. The biggest bookstores held 10,000 books. Barnes & Noble sells, it holds 100,000 books. It's a totally different situation. And in those bookstores, there was no such thing as self-help um, or alternative health or anything like that. There were they, Louise's book was in the occult section <laughs> <laughs> of the bookstore. <laughs> and at that time, no one had ever, like Louise's thoughts were radical, that you could change your who you are by what you think, that your thoughts create your life. No one had ever really said that. People had said it, but it wasn't mainstream. And nowadays, people look at You Can Hear Your Like as like the beginner's guide to self-help. But back then, it was radical, different, and, and she was like on the cutting edge of everything. So she went on Oprah and Donahue, and the business, like, all of a sudden took off. Walden Books and B. Dalton Books were calling to put their book, put, put the books in. Those were the biggest chains at the time back then. And they finally got their books in there. And at the same time, the, when the business took off, she came across the hall to the CPA firm and said, now what do I do? Like before it was a small little business. It was doing well. I mean, a million dollars in sales, that's good. She was thrilled. She never even thought it would get to be that big. But things started to take off. So people were ordering 20,000 books every week, like that kind of taking off compared to 2,000. So the, she went over talked to this, our partners of the CPA firm, and they assigned, did, assigned me and a guy named Mike to do the accounting for Hay House. And so we, like I said, we thought all those people were a little weird, and so we're like, oh my God, how do I get this client, you know? <laughs> I could be going to this movie star's house and doing his accounting, but no, I'm stuck here. <laughs> and at that time, um, it was right in the middle of, well, the beginning part of the AIDS crisis in America. And at that time, the president of the United States wouldn't even say the word AIDS. Like, it was before any movie stars were involved in the AIDS movement, before any of that. But Louise was right in the middle of it. 
and she started a support group with three people in her living room, and it went to her on, she was doing it at that time at a park in West Hollywood with a thousand people every week, and it was called the Hayride. And um, she was saying, like, we don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to take a positive approach to helping the people that have AIDS. But us being accountants over here across the hall, we were scared to death to go in, the, in there because there was, like, all these gay people, and they might have AIDS, and we would run out and wash our hands, and we were scared to death at that time. And um, but we started doing the work for them and um, helping them, and then they started getting our bills and decided that they needed to hire somebody to do the accounting for them rather than pay a CPA firm to do all the everyday accounting and that sort of thing. And at that time, I was deciding that maybe I didn't want to do public accounting for my whole life, and I wanted to work in a business where I could really help them grow rather than just fix all their problems. No one really wants to talk to their CPAs. They have to pay taxes. They have to do this. They have to pay for an audit they don't really want, you know, like all these things. And so I decided, um, Hay House decided they were going to look for somebody, and I decided that I'm going to try to get a job there. And I'm talking to my friends and going, you know, I'm thinking about maybe working there, and they're going, what is, is that that weird lady that thinks you can heal yourself with your thoughts? Are you out of your mind? Like, <laughs> and I said, well, I'm just, you know, she, she thinks that, but she really believes it. Like, she's not trying to, like, get rich. She doesn't care. She just wants to help people. She just wants to um, make a difference for people, and, and I think I can help them reach more people. Um, you know, I know all that stuff is really weird, but I think the business side, it'll be a good opportunity. And so I applied for the job, and at that time, someone was helping them run the company. Her name was Linda, and she was the president of the company. And Louise was traveling around the country doing workshops, and so um, I was hired by Linda. And... Um, and at my very first day in the office at Hay House, I was sitting in my office, and Louise came in, and she said, hi, I'm Louise, who are you? And I said, I'm Reed Tracy, the new financial director. And she looked at me, and she goes, oh, uh, I thought we hired the other guy. <laughs> 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 and that's a true story. <laughs> And she was like, and so the other guy who she thought we hired was Mike, the other accounting guy, and he's still our CPA to this day at Hay House with a different, his own firm now, but he's still our CPA. And so it's been a long time that I've been at Hay House, and I've learned a lot along the way as well. Like I said, I didn't know anything about the self-help business. I d didn't know anything about the publishing business. So I was hired to do the accounting. And at that time, I said, like I said, Linda was running it, but she was from the movie business. And the movie business is really, really good at spending money, but they're not that good at making money. <laughs> I mean, the big companies are, but all the little ones, like it's a, it's a, place where they're great at spending money, they get investors, and if it doesn't work, they just get more investors. And so we um, had our place on Wilshire Boulevard, a little um, office with our people in it, and they decided to move the office to 5th and Santa Monica, which any of you who've been in Santa Monica, that's right by the beach in the middle of everything. They got a whole floor there. We had 42 employees and 30 vice presidents. <laughs> and I wasn't even a vice president. <laughs> it was everyone else was. And um, it's even funny telling the story. <laughs> um, and so basically the company did what many companies do. And they went from small to big, successful, but they didn't manage the growth that they had. They ended up not having enough money and I kept telling them, look, you're spending too much money. They said, you don't know anything about this. Just do the accounting. I go, I, go, I know, but you're spending too much money. And that's what you hired me to tell you. They said, don't worry, kid. We'll, we'll figure it out. And then one day I went into Louise and said, 
Like, I have no idea how you're going to make the payroll next week. But I've been telling you everyone, and no one wants to listen to me. And, you know, I'm going to go get another job, but I don't know what you're going to do. And she goes, wait, wait, wait. She goes, I'm going to call my friend. And she called her friend who was in charge of uh, Max Factor, the cosmetic company. He was the business guy with Max Factor that helped start and run that company. And he was retired then, but she had him come in. And he said, okay, bring all your executives in the conference room. And so all 32 vice presidents and me <laughs> came in. And um, the good thing about having that giant office, we had a big conference room. And so he goes, okay, I'm going to go around the room and ask you what we should do about this situation. And he started with the first person, went around, and I was the last person. And he said, what should you do? And I said what I thought they should do, which was basically fire everybody in the, in the room, including myself and the president, everybody, and cut back down to like 12 or 13 people and run the business the way what it, what it could support. And he said, okay, do it and do it right now. Do what he said and do it right now. So Louise had to let go all the people. Thirty, like we went from 42 to 12, so 30 people, which wasn't a great thing to have to do. And then she and I said, "Look, I already have. Like I was deciding, am I going to go to UCLA and get my MBA? I got it accepted there, and I had an offer to have a job at at that time. It was called Financial News Network. Now it's like I think CNBC Bottom or something. I don't know, but." Um, and she goes, well, will you just stay for a little while and help with this transition? And, and I'd really rather have you run the company since you – and I said, look, I don't know anything about publishing or selling or doing any of this stuff. And she goes, I know, but I think you'll be able to do it. And I said, okay, but I'll do it with this other guy. His name was Jim, who was the sales guy. I said, he'll do all the selling and dealing with the authors, and I'll do all the business stuff. And then we'll we'll do it together. And so I, that's how basically I started running Hay House. About a year and a half later, Jim left, and ever since then I've been in charge of the company. Um, during that time, I did all basically up until like two or three years ago. I've done. 100% of the acquisitions of the authors or the books and audios and things that we did. Um, so I had not only was I running the company, but I had a real connection with all the authors and the products and picking the books and knowing why the books are picked. Um, and um, now we have someone named Patty who does that. I don't do that anymore, but I still consult with her about each person that we pick at Hay House, um, and so, uh, and the reason I tell you that is so that you get an understanding that, like, when I talk about the publishing, I'm not talking about from way up here as the CEO of this big company, but that I started at the bottom, at the beginning, and we grew the company to $100 million, but it took time, one step at a time, the whole entire way, and, um, and that the success came really, one of the keys to the success of Hay House is that we always paid attention to our clients, so to the customers. We al Louise always wanted to make sure that, you know, we took care of all the people that read our books. In fact, at the very beginning, and that's something for all of you to think about as you're developing your coaching business. You know, like how can you make sure that you take care of all your clients? How can you make sure that, you know, all the people that are connected with you in whatever way that you're doing your best to help them in the ways you can? Obviously, you, you can't give them free coaching for life, but you can give them the help they want at the time they want. And how Louise um, emphasized that is that she – used to every single solitary letter that we got, this is before email, but every single letter that we got sent to us at Hay House got a personal answer from Louise for 15 years. Every single one. So how we did that was 
the you know many of the questions were the same so we made a database of all her answers that she had written so if someone had breast cancer then she had the answer we would send it out so we had someone that their full-time job was answer louise's letters and then when we got a letter that was new or different that we didn't have the answer louise would write the answer and then we would have the answer for the future people but that's something that lots and lots of people, thousands and thousands of people around the world remember receiving a letter from Louise. So in your coaching business, if you can think of a way to make an impact on all the people that you meet along the way, they're not going to forget that. So there's another story by another one of our authors, Dr. Wayne Dyer. You guys ever heard of him? <laughs> And so what he did, and, and le I'll finish up with Louise. So for 15 years, she answered every letter. Then came email and the Internet, and then she got so many thousands and thousands of emails that we couldn't keep up with it anymore. So we just tried to supply the free information in other places. We published the book, Letters to Louise, which had all the answers to everyone's questions. And we tried to just get as many of those answers as we could out there still to people. Um, so then Wayne Dyer, so what, ever since he began his career in 1976, he published a book called Your Erronea Zones. And it was the number one selling book in the decade of the 1970s of nonfiction. And he's had a New York Times bestselling book every decade since. So in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010, I don't know if anyone else has ever done that, but, and, um, and what he does is, so every single person that wrote him, he would send a free book. Like if you wrote a letter to Wayne Dyer, you got a free book. And at, when I first met him, the book that he was giving away was called Gifts from Icus, which was his fiction book. And he bought every one of those books from the publisher. He would have it at his house, and his, him and his assistant, and he would sign them all, and, the, and his assistant would pack them up and send them off to everyone. So he didn't answer every letter, but he sent every single person a free book. And still to this day, if you've seen Way, Wayne Dyer, like in an airport or a restaurant or other than at a speaking event, if you come up to him and go, hi, are you Wayne Dyer? He'll go, oh, have you ever had seen my movie, The Shift? And he'll give you a free copy of the movie. So still to this day, after all those years, all that success, he still wants to give people something for, you know, acknowledging him, for asking some for questions. And the impact that it has is way, b he doesn't even know the impact that it has because it goes beyond that. People, just think of you, your favorite person, you wrote a letter, they sent you something free that you never expected. You're probably going to tell someone else about it, right? So um, I, well another one of our authors, Cheryl Richardson, have you guys heard of her? She was like one of the very first people in coaching, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a second. But she was at a, uh, a party with her friends, like just in, in, May, I mean in Massachusetts where she lives. And there was like 30, 40 people there. And her aunt is telling this story about how she got a free, and she didn't even know that Cheryl knew Wayne Dyer or anything. And they're sitting there at this party talking about, her aunt is talking about how she got, she wrote to Wayne Dyer and got 20 years ago he sent her a signed book free. So you don't even understand the connection thing you can make with people just doing those simple things. And like Cheryl Richardson, who I mentioned for a second, like she was one of the very, very, very first coaches. She was the like first president of the coaching society or whatever. And um, and what she she like when she started coaching, people she would go to a cocktail party, and people ask her what it, she did, and she just said, "I'm a coach," and they would say, "What team?" <laughs> You guys are so much luckier because you're in the position where a lot of people know what coaches are, life coaches, business coaches, 
I think I read something like in Business Week magazine, like one in five executives has their own, have a coach. So back when she started, no one even knew what it was. But she, or and what she does as far as her giveaway thing is, is she has these cards that we do. And everything that she does, she gives a free card. So if she pays the bill at the restaurant, she gives them a free card with an inspirational thought. When she pays her bill, she puts in a free card with an inspirational thought. When she goes to the bank, she gives the teller a free card with an inspirational thought. So there's, I just tell those stories to give you ideas of ways to expand what you're trying to do in the world and help people along the way. So now I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about self-publishing versus traditional publishing. So um, how many of you want to write a book? Quite a few, that's good. How many of you have already written a book? And how many of you that have written one and self-published the book? And how many of you that have written one had a traditional publisher publish it? Two, three, two. All right. So I'm going to tell you, perfect. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a little bit about traditional publishing, how you get your book published, what you have to do, and then I'll go into self-publishing. So, And we have a, like a short time, so I'm just going to give you like the overview of it. And at the very end, I'm going to let you guys ask some questions for all the things I leave out that you guys want to know. But um, so for traditional publishing, there's uh, there the number one most important thing for traditional publishing is the platform. And what your platform is, is how your direct connection to the audience that you can sell the book to. So every traditional publisher wants to know what you're going to do to help them sell the book. So the, in the old days of publishing five years ago, <laughs> people, the main, what publishers would do is they would get their books into the store and 50% of all books purchased were purchased by people that would go in their store for one book and come out with two. So the main job of a traditional publisher was distribution, getting the books into the stores. In today's world, 50 to 70% of the books purchased in the United States are purchased from a company called Right. And when you go into Amazon, you don't see any other books. You might see 10 other books. If you go into Barnes & Noble, just walking to your section in the bookstore, you're going to go by 30,000 books or 40,000 books. You, know, you might say, oh, I'm going for this one. Oh, this one looks interesting, and I should get this for my friend, and all those sort of things. And so what traditional publishers would do is get it in people would go in and buy them and there was no other place to buy a book except at the bookstore now with amazon when you go to buy amazon you might see 10 other books down there that they also bought but you mostly don't pay that much attention to those books every now and then you might buy an, an extra one or two but it's not that you don't sell that many extra books and so traditional publishers still think their only job is to do distribution. So that makes the job of the author, they have to sell the book. So the people that have tradi traditionally published the book, I'm sure they realize this already, but for all of you that haven't, I'll tell you that a traditional publishers, publisher expects basically 95 to 100% of the marketing and selling to be done by the author. 95 to 100 percent and th they're going to expect you to sell the book they're going to give you an advance so money to publish your book and in exchange for that they're expecting you to sell the book and that's the reason why when they're deciding what books to publish they're looking for the person with the biggest connection or the biggest audience already because if you have a big audience and that audience might be email names social media, websites, blogs, 
You might be able to go on TV. You might ha be in magazines, newspapers, whatever it is. But they want you to have a direct connection to your audience in order for you to sell the book. So even at Hay House, where we have a very big marketing capability, we have 3 million people on our email list. We have 8 million people on social media. We have Hay House Radio that reaches a million people every month. We have all these things that most publishers don't have. We still expect 80% of the selling to be done by the author. And so that's the reason that the, may, the traditional publishers are looking for those platforms. In order to get your book published by a traditional publisher, you're going to need to get an agent more than likely. That isn't 100% true. The smaller um, publishers will take um, unsolicited manuscripts, we call them. Like Hay House, we only take um, manuscripts from people who, with agents in the United States. In Australia and the UK, we take unsolicited manuscripts, but in the United States, we only take um, them by agents. And most major publishers only take books by agents, take submissions by agents. When you submit your book, you're going to submit it. W usually, you don't have to write the book first if it's a nonfiction book. That's another big myth in publishing is you think you have to write the whole book before a publisher will take it. The publisher just wants a book proposal, which is, which you can, uh, I can't go into the whole contents of it, but basically it's an introduction to who you are. It's a, um, about your, the marketing you can do, your platform. It's about other competitive books. It's about an outline a detailed outline of what's in the chapter, maybe a paragraph about what's in every chapter, and then a sample chapter so that they can tell what your writing is. And usually people without big platforms, without big connections to their audience, stick that marketing part way in the back about their platform, but the publishers will see that. <laughs> If they read the beginning part, your introduction, and are intrigued, the next part they go to is the marketing before they even see what the book, any more about the book. So with a traditional publisher, that's the constraints that you have. You have to have a big direct connection to your audience, and you have to more than likely get an agent. If you have a big platform, getting an agent is easy. If you don't have a big platform, getting an agent is just as hard as getting a publisher. And getting an agent doesn't guarantee you'll get a publisher. And, you know, there's a lot, obviously a lot more to that. Like when we do our weekend workshops, I spend hours talking about that. But since I only have 56 more minutes, I don't think that'll be a good idea. <laughs> so um, the that's basically the bottom line for the traditional publisher. The big surprise for most people is that the um, traditional publisher doesn't do all the work in selling. I would say that 70% of the authors published, new first-time authors published by a traditional publisher, think that the publisher is going to sell the book. So we have an author um, named Pam Grout. Have you guys, uh, any of you heard of her? She wrote a book called E Squared. Have you guys heard of that book, anyone? Raise your hands, let's see. Yep, so quite a few of you. Um, that book was Pam's 16th book. So Pam was under the belief for the first 15 that the publisher was going to do all the marketing. She was a writer. And her job, she felt, was to write the books. She was a very good writer. And so every time she wrote a book, there was an, her agent was able to get it published by a publisher. But the problem with Pam's approach was, even though she had published 15 books before E Squared, none of them sold. I mean, they sold like 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, small numbers for for a traditional publisher. Those are good numbers if you're going to self-publish and you're going to use that to help build your um, coaching practice, which I'm going to get into in a second. But if you're a traditional publisher, that's not that good. 
So what happened with Pam is is that she sent us a book. She sent E squared to us, and she sent the proposal, just like I said. And our editor read the proposal and read the sample chapter and said, man, this is so good. Like, the idea is good, the chapter's good, everything's good, but I know you're not going to want to publish it because no platform. <laughs> she had no idea that you had, she had a blog called George Clooney Slept Here. <laughs> and, and that's because her main job is a travel writer. And the blog, you know, had good traffic, and and the writing was really good, but that doesn't help you that much with a self-help book when you have George Clooney slept here. And so um, we decided to take a chance with this book, and we decided to do um, basically a, a version of self-publishing through Hay House with the book. And that is that we did the book as print-on-demand, which those of you who have done a self-published book, you probably did that as well, which means you can print one copy at a time, 10, 100, whatever you need. You don't have to print a whole warehouse full of them. In the old days of self-publishing, which I is, is five or six years ago before the internet, um, and before the advent of print-on-demand, if you self-published a book, you would have to put print two, three, four, five thousand copies at a time. And so you would print five thousand copies, you would get them, you would put them in your garage, you would say, honey, I swear to God, this is going to be the biggest seller ever. Those are going to be out of there. And he or she would go, I know, honey, it's going to do good. And, you, and then a week later, you would have like ten gone to your best friend, your cousin, your mother. And your significant other would say, well, do you think how much longer is it going to be? Well, we have this stack here. And a year later, we would come back and there would be 4,900 of the 5,000 left. And basically, the, with the advent of print on demand, you don't need to do that anymore. You can literally print one at a time. 10 at a time, whatever you need to do. So the cost and the bar barrier of entry for, for self-publishing changed dramatically. And, and if you add in e-books into that, it changed even more. So you don't even have to print a book with e-books. You can just have it as an electronic book. For nonfiction books, however, 70% of the sales are physical books. 30% are e-books. So if you decide to self-publish a book and you only do an e-book, you're missing out on 70% of the market, basically. Um, so um, with Pam, we decided to do the book as print-on-demand and as an e-book. And we did it as a low-priced e-book. So we priced the e-book at $1.99. And we priced the physical book at like 15.95 so but what we wanted to do and this is a tip for all of you who decide to self publish is that we wanted to have the book for a dollar 99 number 1 because we found that if you give things away for free people don't value them and they might they might take the book but they'll never read it and but if you charge even a dollar 99 they'll value the book and they'll read the book because they paid $1.99 for it. And the number one way that books are sold in the world is word of mouth. So just think about for your own life, how many books have you read and you loved and you told everyone you knew about the books? How many uh, people have told someone about a book they've read? So look around, that's everybody in the whole entire place. And how many of you have bought a book recommended by a friend? Everybody in the place. So that's the number one way that books are sold. And guess what the number one way that you get clients as a coach is? Word of mouth. I don't know what Christian says, but I say it's word of mouth. And if you pay attention to the word of mouth, you'll find out what, what things you're doing good 
that your client, that you can get uh, extra clients. So in other words, if you work with a client and that client refers you another client, you should ask the new client, what is the reason they told you to come to me? And when they tell you that reason, you should start thinking about, wow, maybe that's the niche area that I'm really good at. Because being a coach and writing books are very similar in the sense that you're way better off when you have a niche area that you're really great at. So if you're going to publish a book, the most successful books at the beginning, you have a niche audience that you're aiming for, and then it goes out from there. I'm not saying that eventually the book couldn't go to a whole bunch of more people, but at the beginning, if you have a niche audience that you're really concentrating on, the chance of success is much greater. And I, agree, I, I believe that in coaching, it's very similar, at least the coaches I've seen. When they're really, really good at one area, they can't stop the clients from coming in because everyone knows if you need help in this area, come to this person. And their, their clients become their best references because they're telling everybody, this area is the thing that they do it in. So what we do is we took Pam's book, we did the $1.99 ebook, we did the free, I mean the higher price physical book, and then we, we started promoting the book. Well, Pam started promoting the book. We weren't really even paying that much attention to the book, to be honest with you, because we expect 80% of the sales to come from the author. Um, so the book gets out there, and um, on July 13th, um, a couple years ago, I um, looked at our sales for ebooks from January until June, and the number one selling ebook at Hay House, quantity wise, was E squared. And I'm like, what the heck? You know, like, let me get this book. And I, or I downloaded the book from Amazon because <laughs> it's way cheaper to get a $1.99 book than bring it over from the warehouse with all the gas and all that. <laughs> so I started reading. I mean, I had known about the book because I told you guys I approve all the books that we publish at A House, but I didn't read the whole book. You know, I just read the proposal, the sample chapter, it seemed good. And the editor was so passionate about the project. But we didn't invest a lot in it. We basically did it as a self-published book. So I got that book and I read through it. And basically the subtitle of the book says, Energy Experiments That Prove Your Thoughts Create Your Life. And that's what Louise has been teaching forever since she started. I go, interesting, and so I read the book, and the experiments were cool, and I tried one, and so I sent the book to Wayne Dyer, and he tried an uh, energy experiment, and, um, and he, his, his experiment was to find one of those little scrunchies, you know, that you put in your hair, girls put in their hair to hold them in a thing, and why he would try that was he has less hair than I do. <laughs> But that was his thing, and like within an hour, he found it. He found it in his shower on a, on a shampoo bottle, and he goes, I swear to God it wasn't there before, but it was there. He just didn't notice it. And then he found one at the bottom of a swimming pool a little later and on this path to Black Rock, and he goes, that's cool. You know, this is good. I'm going to tell people about this book, and I gave it to Louise. She goes, you know, I like these experiments. It kind of proves what I've been teaching all my life. And they started promoting it on their Facebook pages. And we started promoting it on other Facebook pages that we had. And it went to become number one on the New York Times bestsellers list. But the reason it became number one on the New York Times bestseller list is 100% word of mouth. So we started with that low-priced ebook. We got lots and lots of people to start reading it. But if the book was no good, it would have stopped there, because we don't have the no one has the power to make a book number one without getting other people to tell their friends about it. Um, so we we did that. We started so it started taking off. And not only do they tell their friends about it in the United States. 
but in Australia, Canada, the UK, it became huge in Germany, um, like 40 countries around the world. So it's, it's in, and as those books are published, it became an international huge success story, all from that one little self-published book, basically through the Hay House brand. So self-publishing, what it does is, is it allows you to publish a book when a regular publisher wouldn't want to do it. The disadvantages of self-publishing are that you have to pay for it and that you have to get the expertise to help you with the publishing process. So the one, some very important parts of it are that you need to use an editor to help you do it. And uh, because you're not going to make a word of mouth worthy book just if you sit down and write it yourself and have your best friend who's really good at English do the editing. <laughs> you need to help, you need to find somebody that's edited a book before, who knows what the content needs to be, knows how to put that together so that people are going to tell their friends about the book. Um, there's all different services available that can help you do it. Hay House has a self-publishing division called ba Balboa Press. Um, there's Amazon that has, Balboa Press does offer like cover designers and editors and those kind of things. And that's, it's, a, it's um, the step up from doing it yourself. But then there's a also a step higher that if you hire even more experienced editors, even more experienced designers, you can do that part yourself. There's a company called knliterary.com and they offer all kinds of editorial services. And that has no association with Hay House, but I just like to give you a, a reference if you're looking for people to help you edit your book, help you ghostwrite the book, because um, the other thing is, is that not every single, not all of you um, may be able to sit down and write a book yourself but you might have an incredible story, you might have incredible information that you want to share with people or that you want to use to help you get more clients into your business, but you don't have the time or you don't have the ability to write the book yourself, that's okay. Um, there's lots and lots and lots of people with the ability to write books. Um, you just have to provide the information to them. So some of the ways that you can provide information to people to help you write the book, whether it's self-published or traditionally published, is that now if you do a traditionally published book, they're going to expect you to turn it in to them, you know, done. So they're not going to write it for you, but you can still hire a writer to help you write it before you turn it into a traditional publisher. And obviously, if you're a self-publisher, you'll need to have it written. But one way to, to write the material in a book is to do exactly what I'm doing here, speak to an audience. And if you speak to your audience for a weekend, you'll have more than enough material to write a whole book. You'll have, you'll have a big, thick book, like for a whole weekend. Now, you can't just transcribe it, and because the way you talk and the way you write are completely different. But you're going to have the basis, the ideas, the stories, all those sort of things that you can put together to make a book. And you, you can do a weekend seminar for 50 people, 20 people, 10 people. It doesn't have to be a big crowd of people. But just so that you can get that information out if you're better at speaking than you are at writing. Or, um, <coughs> so that's one of the options. No matter which way you do a book, I highly recommend that you do a very, very detailed outline before you start. So if you're gonna um, if you're gonna use someone to help you write the book, it's absolutely essential that you do that outline because then you're gonna go through and make sure it all makes sense, the stories that you want to have, all that, so that when they write the book, it's all you in the book. You don't want the book to come out with the voice of someone else. You want it to come out with the voice of yourself. So, um, so that's uh, a, a very important part either way. That's one of the biggest mistakes that people make 
is they don't take the time to do that outline. They go, oh, I know what I want to write. I'll sit and do it. They write the whole book. They give it to an editor, and they're like, oh, my God, this thing's a mess. Um, and it needs all this work. We need to rewrite it. We need to do that. But the more effort you put up front, and it might take you a month to do the outline. I'm not talking about like a long weekend. I mean, take a lot of time and effort to put into that outline to make sure that it has all the details that you want for your book. And then, um, and then you can get help to write it or write it yourself. Um, the print on, like I said, the print on demand part of book publishing makes it easy. The electronic book part makes it easy. I still, if you're gonna, if your goal with the self-published book is to sell a lot of books, it's still better to build your platform before you do the book. But if your goal is to help build your platform, you can use the self-published book to do that. So that's, a lot of people say it's like my business card. Because still, even though there's about 300,000 self-published books done every year, and there's about 380,000 books published like last year or the year before in the United States, which is a lot of books and even more around the world, even though all those books are published, still publishing a book gives you a ton of credibility and authority, even self-published books. And that authority comes from those, from the media, from bloggers, from other people. Like if you say, here's my book, people are impressed with that and they, it gives you authority. And if you can get people to take their time and read your book and, and the book is good, you're going to be able to add a lot of clients from the use of your book. Um, we have many, I, every single one of our authors, I, when I used to meet with them and we used to do, now we do a lot higher level of author and they mostly have big platforms before we publish them. But at the beginning, we used to do all kinds of beginning authors because we were small and no one knew who we were and we would have to help them along the way. And I used to say to every single one of them, lots of them were coaches just like you guys or in some teaching thing of teaching the philosophies and thoughts and ideas that they were putting in their book. And I said, the one guarantee th that if you did a book with us is that your coaching business will be 100% full and that your seminar business will be double what it is today. Because that's the power of the books. If you get people to actually read your book and that the book's good and it helps them, they're going to want to learn more from you. And here's another secret about book publishing is that no, almost no one makes a living publishing books. So all the authors that are household names that you guys know about, almost every single one of them makes more money speaking or coaching than they do of, from royalties from books. Because there's not that much money in books, but it's an incredible way to build the other parts of your business. Of the 80,000 traditionally published books um, published every year, about 300 sell over 50,000. So 300 of 80,000 books sell over 50,000. And that's fiction and nonfiction. And that's brand new books. More than that sell 50,000 in a year that of the old books. Like You Can Heal Your Life has sold 50,000 every year for 30 years. But of brand new books published, 300, around 300, obviously it varies a little. And that includes the new John Grisham, the new J.K. Rowling, the new Wayne Dyer, the new Deepak Chopra, the new whatever book, household name you can think of. So the, of brand new authors, the number's even less. But how people, but even if you sell 3,000 of your book, it could change your entire business. So here's a story about um, an author that's basically just like you guys, a beginning that wants to be a coach. Her name's Nancy Levin. She used to be the event director at Hay House. So she was the event director at Hay House up until a year ago. 
um, and uh, she started um, just being an event director. She loved being an event director. She did her thing, and she wrote. Uh, uh, she read a. She wrote a poem and read it at uh, at the wedding of one of our employees, and and. I didn't even go to the wedding, but someone told me that I said, oh, man, this is pretty good. Did, did you hear about Nancy and her poem at the wedding? I said, no. And they said, oh, here it is. And I read it. And I go, oh, wow, it's pretty good. And I called her up. I go, oh, you're a real poet. <laughs> and come to find out, she had a um, master's degree in poetry. And, you know, she had all this background to be a poet, but she never you know, she wrote every day and she wrote lots of poems, but she never thought that she was going to use that in any other way. And then um, she had um, a big, um, basically she got divorced from her husband after 20 years or around 20 years. And um, she had all kinds of poems basically of her journey through that. And and we had her start reading the poems at the I Can Do It events that we do before, like just for three minutes, and then she would introduce, here's Wayne Dyer, and read a poem, and here's um, Robert Holden, or whoever the speakers were, and people liked the poems, and I said, well, why don't you, uh, we had just started Balboa Press, the self-publishing division at that time, and I said, why don't you put all those poems together in a book, and self-publish it through Balboa Press because Hay House doesn't do poetry books. And poetry books are hard to sell, but for you, you can self-publish it. We can sell it to the people that love your poems because every time you read one, people come up and say, oh my God, I love that poem, where can I get it? And you can sell them when you give talks and you can it'll be on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and all those places. So she put all the poems in a book and she kind of did them by categories and she started doing that. And then um, she went a little further and I said, well, why don't you tell people why you did each of those poems? So write a page about that each part of your transition of healing from, you know, going through this whole process with your husband and why you did the poems. And so she did a page about each section and there's like five sections. So it's, you know, it's a hundred poems and five pages of writing. And more people wanted to buy the book when they got the writing and the poems. And then um, we started having Nancy, well, part of her healing transition for her through this whole process was she was friends with Debbie Ford. Do you guys know who Debbie Ford is? And so Debbie said, I want you to come to my, um, to my um, seminar, the light worker seminar, the shadow process. So she came and did that, and it was super healing for her. And then she said, okay, now I want you to become a certified coach. Not, she never thought she was going to coach any individual people but she was doing it for her own self and so she went through this year-long process to become a certified coach with Debbie Ford and her institute and um, so she did that training and then at the same time we started we said well Nancy they like your poem so much what we're gonna let you like w part of what we started adding to the I can do it events were 20-minute talks by new authors or beginning people. And so we said, why don't you do one of the 20 minutes? And she's like, oh, my God, I don't know. You know, like, I don't mind being the event director and the MC, but like a whole 20-minute talk. And so, um, so one of the first times that she did the talk was on um, a cruise ship that we did. We do seminars on cruise ships. And... Um, and one of the seminars that Cheryl Richardson and I teach is called Speak, Write, and Promote, to teach people how to give speeches, how to write their book, and promote themselves. And um, so we went, wa we were on some island in the South Pacific or something, and we're walking around the island with her practicing her speech. <laughs> I'm like, give more details, tell the story, you know. And so she did this 20-minute speech, and people loved it. 
and especially the people that were going through the same thing as she was going through, like leaving their spouse or having trouble in their marriage or those sort of things. So she started giving those speeches, and then I said, well, now you know what you have to do is you have to write a book, a real book. And she, like I said, she'd been writing forever in her journal. So she thought, oh, this is going to be a piece of cake. I'm going to write myself a book. And um, the name of her book is called Jump and Your Life Will Appear. And, um, and basically it's a story, her story, of going through this, these problems with her marriage of 20 years and everything that go, goes along with that. But she sat down to write the book, and she wrote the whole entire book, and she gave it to her friend, Kelly Nataris, who that's the KN Literary. It's, she has this, she's the editor. She used to be an editor in New York. She was the editor of Sounds True, the main person that was one of their first book editors at Sounds True. She was in charge of the whole book division. Um, so she gave her this book and said, Kelly, let me know what you think, you know, and she sat and read it and she said, you can't publish it like this. <laughs> and she said that you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to get an editor or even better yet, you're going to have to get a writer to help you do it. And that was devastating for her being a writer for all these years. Her master's in poetry, she'd been writing, but she ended up getting a writer to help her write the entire book, and it ended up being the greatest process ever, because the book, if you read the book, you would swear Nancy said or wrote every single word, because it's totally in her voice, but it, it was a, in a process that she couldn't do. Like, she knows how to write poetry, she knows how to write journals, she knows how to write blogs, but she didn't know how to write books. So she got the book published. She put self-published that through Balboa Press. And even though that she knows us all at Hay House and she was part of Hay House, she didn't have really a big platform for us to publish the book. And the other great thing about self-publishing is that you can do it fast. So if you traditionally publish a book, if right now I say, okay, your book is incredible, you have a great platform, we're going to publish it with Hay House, it'll come out at the very, 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 very soonest, the spring of 2017. 2017. So because we already have all our books scheduled for, I mean, we're basically done with our books. for the, We have to sell our book, traditional publishers, you have to sell your books six months in advance to the major publishers. So we've, to the major retailers, so like Barnes & Noble, all those places. So we've already sold all our books for 2015. Like all the people at Hay House are working on the spring of 2016 right now. Like... And you have to produce them early so you can print them, so you can market them, so you can do all these things. And that's the same with any major publisher. It's going to, at a minimum, it'll take 18 months from the day you sign the contract till your book's in. And, and usually when you sign the contract, the book's not done. And even if you think it's done, it's not done. And because you, with a traditional publisher, you're going to turn that book in. And they're gonna, and you're gonna think, oh, I'm done. Relax. Let's go to Hawaii. And you're gonna, they're gonna look at that book. And if you did an incredible job, you're gonna get ten pages of notes that you have to fix. And I've seen as many as three hundred pages of notes. And that's, and you want that because you want the book to be as good as it can be for the word of mouth process. And so Nancy, she got the writer, she got the editor, they got the book done. Um, she started speaking, still doing her 20-minute speeches for Hay House, and even more people were buying the book. She got, she, at that same time, I started talking to her about, you know, what she really wanted to do. And what she really wanted to do is what all of you really want to do or are doing, which w is be a coach. And I said, great, so we're going to, she goes, uh, you know, maybe I should leave Hay House, like, and then, and I should just do it. I said, look, don't leave Hay House yet. Let's make a plan of how to be a coach. Like, let's, 
decide how you're going to use this book that you just published, use the speaking, use these things to establish your coaching business with uh, the expertise that you have. And the number one thing you have to do if you want to be a coach is you have to find someone to coach, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to publish this book and you're going to talk about your coaching in the back of the book and you're going to do this speech. And then during this 20-minute speech, you're going to get 100 or 200 people to come buy your book and you're going to tell them about your new coaching business that you're just starting. You're doing individual coaching. You're going to do it. You're not going to do it for one hour at a time. You're going to make them commit to 10 hours and they're going to pay you $2,500 for the 10 hours if they're if you're going to be their coach. She's like, I don't know, that's so much money. No one knows. What are they going to do? I said, just try it. I said, and you're going to give them a free, free coaching session in order to show them that you're good at coaching. They can get one free session, and if they like it, they can sign up for the 10. So she published the book. She got a bunch of her friends who are all Hay House authors and different people to promote the book. The book started selling really, really well, and we ended up picking up at it up at Hay House and published the book through Hay House. So she got her book published from a traditional publisher by first self-publishing it, which all of you can do. That's a usually a question people ask, is if I self-publish my book, it, does that eliminate my chance to have a traditional publisher? And the answer is no. In fact, if you successfully self-publish the book and it starts selling, you're going to get all kinds of agents, all kinds of publishers begging you to publish the book. Because then they know it's a, a good book that's going to sell, and they know with their distribution it's going to sell way more. So that's another benefit of self-publishing. You can get it done quickly. You can get your self-published book done in two or three months or maybe a little longer by the time you do a great cover, have it edited, like all the things, instead of a, a year or two years. A and if you make it a success, you can get out of the publishing business, sell your rights to a traditional publisher, but get all the benefits of having that book out there, which is to get more clients. So Nancy, she started um, getting the more clients. She started um, doing the speeches. She ended up getting 10 individual clients, paying her the money that we said. So over, and, and then what she did after that is she started doing um, groups. So she wanted to not have all her time taken up by individual clients. So she decided that I'm going to do seven individual clients and three groups of 12 to 15 people. And then she started doing the same thing, a free lesson for the groups. She would get 12 to 15 people sign up. And then from her groups is how she gets all her individual clients now. And it all started with a self-published poetry book <laughs> that no one would believe. And now she has a very, very, very successful coaching business, like with a waiting list to get into her groups and into her thing, all within like 18 months. So it's a, it's a great story. So, all right, so let's do Q&A. Does anyone have any questions that I didn't cover, which there's lots of things? <laughs> So if you guys can line up here, I'll do that. And I have about 15 minutes, so I'm going to go through as quick as I can to try to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, two quick questions. Um, you mentioned a big platform. Can you define that? A big platform, like for Hay House, we would want to have, you have, you have like 50,000 email names, maybe 100,000 people on Facebook with like an engagement of, at least 10 to 30 percent engaged in your posts um, like a business going already if you're if you're it's an online based business where you're interacting bringing revenue from that source or um, a connection like you're on TV or you've been on Dr. Oz or you go on the doctors or you in the New York Times or another platform building thing is like your education like if you're an MD or a PhD and you have a that kind of thing that can help too because we know that 
certain television stations that might, if it's a category that works when you have that professional designation, that can help. But a lot of times now we're looking at your online reach. Okay. And um, thank you. And the second question is, um, let's just say one of us got a, um, um, an offer to have a book published by um, a place like Hay House right. or something else. When we're negotiating for our royalty amounts, what's typical for a first author and then and then yeah. some to ask? Because a lot of us go in blind. We don't know what our rights yeah. are, what to ask. Pretty so standard the royalties are for electronic books, 25% of receipts. And this is for all authors, pretty much what I'm giving you, beginning or advanced authors. For paperback books, it's 7 to 10%. And for hardcover, it's 10 to 15% of the retail price and 7 to 10% of retail for trade or paperback. So it's, it's a seven, okay, got it. Yeah. Yeah, all right. You're welcome. I'm good. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> hardback is 10 to 15% of the retail price. And I, I'll go here and then I'll go there. There's only two there, so. <coughs> so read. If you could wave a magic, a realistic magic wand, <coughs> where would you like your business, would you like Hay House to be in a year's time and in five years' time? Right. As far as what goes? Uh, in terms of um, the impact that you're having, uh, you know, maybe any change in direction, a new, new direction, and how much you'd like to grow and uh, the impact that you're having in the world. Yeah. So basically, I mean, we love the impact that we're having and all the people that we reach. We're selling millions of books. We're reaching, like I said, millions of people around the world all the time. And so we don't, we're not really looking like to say, okay, we're going to go to 200 million, 300 million in sales. We don't really care about that so much anymore. Um, our big direction that we're going, and it's good for all of you as well, is we're going into online learning. So we're, um, like I said, that there's people who read a book are willing to pay a lot more for the information to help introduce it into their lives. Um, it can be from individual coaching, group coaching, or work online workshops. So we're going into doing our own <laughs> online courses with our authors. Um, w in fact, we're launching one right this very minute called Loving Yourself. It's a 21-day mirror work, which is basically to help people with their self-esteem and all that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's from Louise and her co-authors of her books. Um, and we did one with Doreen Virtue to be a certified angel card reader, Susie Orman to help you with your will, trust, and we're going to do a bigger one with her on just a basic finance course. But we're going to do a 15 to 20 of those online video courses um, this year and going forward. Okay, so great. it's online learning is basically where we're heading. Okay, great. Thank you. And also, I have someone who I've done some work with who I think could be a really good um, addition to what you do. Yeah. How can I connect you guys up? Well, if they have an agent, they can submit their oh, yeah. proposal. That's the best way to do it. So, okay. all right, thank you. All right, thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for your awesome wisdom. Um, I've got a question about book titles, like picking the right title, given that we are in a you know online SEO-driven sort of world. Yeah. What What is Hay House's perspective on that aspect of crafting a book? Well, the book title is a very important thing. Um, a lot of times what I suggest people do is that they come up with, let's say, three or four ideas. And if they have like a social media outlet or Facebook or email or blog or anything like that, say, I'm thinking about writing these three or four books. Which one do you think would be most resonate with you, even though you know it's all the same book? And you can put the titles up, and it, you can be surprised. Like, we're often surprised on the one that people really like more than others. And then the design and execution of the book cover are essential as well. Um, there's many 
there's a company called 99 Designs. I don't know if you guys have heard of them, but that's a really good way to get your book cover designed for a reasonable price by a professional designer. Um, and the same with the book covers. Like you, through 99 Designs, you're going to get a whole bunch of choices, and you can take the three you like the best, put them on social media, see which one they like. Or another great thing, which Christian and I are in the same mastermind with Jeff Walker, and, um, and a lot of times people that are doing books bring their book covers in and get feedback from everyone in the mastermind, bring their book titles in, get feedback from everyone in the mastermind. Christian's super good at book covers and th book titles and all that. He's one of the masters in the group at that. But if you have your own mastermind or group of people that you can get feedback. I would recommend getting the feedback not from like your mother, sister, brother, <laughs> husband, you know, that kind of people, but more of a diverse group. So that's brilliant. Thanks. I have a follow-up question. Um, I have a little book that's done and uh, talking to Sounds True, um, yeah. the head of acquisitions at Sounds True. And also I think um, some of my people are reaching out to, to your people. Okay. Um, but what, what makes Hay House a better fit for, for any of us than it versus Sounds True at yeah. this point? Well, Hay House is much bigger than Sounds True. So our, um, they're good. They're Tammy is Simon is the person that runs it. She's a friend of mine. She, they're a great company, but they're just a lot smaller, and their reach is a lot smaller than ours. So we were able to – we have, like, um, three to eight New York Times bestsellers every year. They have one or none every year. And th at one time, Sounds True was much bigger than Hay House, and now we're like 10 times bigger than they are. So it's just that marketing reach is what Hay House has that no other publisher has anywhere close to the reach that we have through our social media and email. But small could also for a new author. Maybe yeah, a good she's thing. awesome. I, I mean, I would do it with Sounds True, Red Wheel Wiser, um, any of those small publishers. I mean, there's a mil there's hundreds of them. New World Library, they're all great for all of you guys, and they're really, really good. Like, I would not say not to publish with any of them. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi. Um, two questions. One about, the, Misha asked about the title, and I wonder about the subtitles. I've been told that, so the title should be, it's the heart and the feelings, and the subtitle is more head and the results you get from reading the book. Yeah. I finished my book, I got my cover, a designer did it and all. I have my title, The Last Single Mom, but I feel my book, the whole book is the subtitles. I can't focus it to two or three phrases. Is it a big, big bad thing if I don't put any subtitles? What's the title of your book? The Last Single Mom. I would have a subtitle. <laughs> 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 because you need to explain what that means. Like, So does anyone know what The Last Single Mom is? Raise your hand if you would buy the book if you just saw it. Turn around. Good, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> subtitles, okay. What? Well, it's uh, 55,000 words. Uh, but yeah. it, what you, a very important thing for books and for coaching is to be able to talk about what you do in a very short time. Yeah. And so in order to get clients as a coach, you need to be able to tell what you do in two minutes or less. In order to sell books, you have to be able to tell what you do in two minutes or less. So I challenge you to really concentrate before your book's published to be able to tell people about it in that one or two lines, it'll be super helpful for you to make it a success. Just think about social media. Think about, you know, like if you ever get on TV, you have like three minutes to make mm -hmm. an impact or five minutes to make an impact. So you have to be able to do that. So that's a great thing that came from this question is for you to be able to tell people like that what your book's about. Mm -hmm. And once you can do that, you'll have the subtitle. Okay, so anyone who will brainstorm with me on my subtitles would get a free book signed and a big hug. <laughs> okay, so I'm flicki flipping Perfect. my book See, around. Perfect. See, now that's an awesome. Yeah. The back cover. I've listened to a lady saying lots of great things, but I want to ask you, with your experience, uh, a book that is its basically my story, 
So it's real stuff and loaded with exercises and advice of how to, huh? Is it better that I put bullets of what's in there or is it better that I put a picture in my story? Yeah. What, what, how will I get the reader to go, yeah, okay, I want I this. I would tell a little of your story and then some of the things you're gonna help them with. And when you write the book, be sure to have lots of stories throughout the book. That's for everybody. Yeah. Because people remember the stories way more than they remember the stats and the content mm -hmm. and the things like, like when you leave here and you've heard Christian talk for all these days, you're gonna remember all his stories more than you're gonna remember anything else. And that's the same with people when they read the books, they're gonna remember the stories. They're gonna relate to the stories because they're gonna relate those stories to their own life. Okay, I'm gonna remember this for a long time because my legs are shaking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Reed, I, right. I'm almost speechless. I'm Susie Pruden. I'm an oh early. Oh my God! How yeah, are right. You? I'm an early Hay House author. Yes, I you sure are. wish you had been you when I had my book. <laughs> <laughs> you were there, but not in the position that you're in yeah, right now. I, I now, I have sat here. Meta fitness. Meta fitness. Your, your thoughts taking shape. Yeah, you were on Oprah. I was, and. Um, that was an interesting yeah, experience. I, was I am good a New York except Times. The last two minutes. <laughs> Pardon me. I said that appearance was great, except the last two minutes. Well, we worked <laughs> that out. We worked that out. And then what she said, though, on her anniversary, weight loss anniversary, which was funny, the last thing she said was, "If you really want to create a good relationship with your body, you have to get Susie Pruden's book." Oh now, she God. meant to say meta fitness, yeah. but she said, change your mind, change your body. Right. But I hadn't written that one yet. <laughs> <laughs> so now I have a publishing house. It's called Itty Bitty Books. Oh, cool. And I do Itty Bitty Books. Awesome. And I just loved hearing the evolution of Hay House from you. And thank you, because You're I was welcome. there in the very, you very You know beginning. all that was true, I right? know all of it. I was there <laughs> in the very, very beginning. Susie and was there at the beginning. And congratulations. <laughs> thank it's you. It's really a, 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 an extraordinary story. Yeah. I remember your, when we did the BEA with your book was the feature book yes. of our whole company. And, I, a, and um, it was like my very first BEA, so it was like like 1989. Was that one your book or 80? 80 88, 89. Eight, the book yeah, I, I wrote it in 88. Yeah. And and y y everything he said is true. <laughs> everything he said is true. And so 1989. <laughs> and so we did the BEA in May. I uh, uh, at that time, I drove the Hay House van <laughs> to Las Vegas <laughs> with all our books and our display in it. And everyone else in the company that went flew, but I wanted to save the money to drive the thing. <laughs> and we all wore shirts that said Meta Fitness and right. shorts at the BEA, and most <laughs> people wear suits. <laughs> and we stayed at um, like the, the lo like it was $19 a night, the hotel that we stayed at. I, I actually <laughs> got a suite by accident. Yeah, you probably <laughs> but, did. We but there are no you, accidents. <laughs> But yep, that's all it. So it's awesome to see you. Congrats. It's it's awesome to see you. It's awesome to hear what you've done. Yeah. And and really congratulations. Thank it's you. Been a, I know all of us. I mean, eighty nine. My God, that's a while ago. Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> and, and thank you. It's You're been inspiring. Welcome. Great to see you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Last but not least, my name is Joe Nicasio, um, and I'm an author. I wrote. Resurrecting America's Entrepreneurial Spirit, A okay. Practical Approach for Creating Jobs. I'm working on a second book. Uh, I feel blessed in the sense that I did not write this book for me. I wrote it for the people that need it. Uh, this book, the first book, came out of, I, was, I spoke to 50 people who were unemployed. Yeah. They all had bachelor's, master's, and PhDs. And I asked the group, um, how many of you, if you can't, find your dream job through employment, how many would like to get it through entrepreneurship? About 60% of the hands went up. Then I asked, how many of you are afraid of starting your own business? And every hand in the room shot up. So that's what this book was. It, it's a cure for unemployment. The new book is actually coming out of a coaching program that I created. 
the coaching program is called the Employee Escape Plan, How to Create Your Dream Job Through Entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. I have a, a systematic coaching program to teach people how to choose which business to go into, how to position it, package, promote, and persuade to get their cash register to ring. My question is, it's really easy to self-publish. And I would like to go, I mean, I see the benefit of a traditional publisher and getting it on the shelf. What's the steps? Give me some guidance here right. as far as well, which direction I should. Well, I just like an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no, the main thing is, is you have to have a platform to sell the books. Yeah, so my, if you my, have my a platform's big, pretty moderate. I got, I've sold about 500 books out of the back of my yeah. car and got so 3,000 lanes. So it's not lanes. big enough. Yes. I would self-publish. Just self-publish. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. All right, well, my time is up. I want to thank you guys all for letting me talk to you for the last hour. And my big goal for this is, is that all of you are motivated to get your books published. There's uh, like 200 people here. If you all get a book published, you sell 5,000 books, you're going to help a million people change their lives. That's my goal. And thank you all, and good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.